Hey there folks and welcome back. In this lesson we're going to be discussing the change of variables formula for multiple integrals. This is like the substitution rule that you knew back in Calc 2 but now it's a fair bit more involved. It's one of the coolest and most important topics from this part of the course but I'd wager that it's probably the most challenging topic from our integration unit. I thought so as a student, I still think so as an instructor. So it's important that you take your time going through this part of the text and practice, practice, practice. To motivate our discussion, I'd like to remind you about what was done in the last lesson when we converted double integrals into polar coordinates. The idea there was we were trying to integrate over some region D that was just difficult to describe in terms of our Cartesian coordinates X and Y. Take this region for example. Here you can see the region is not type 1, it's not type 2, and its boundary curves are these circular arcs that are just often challenging to work with in Cartesian coordinates. The fix was to apply a change of variables. Rather than working with x and y's, we can use a transformation, x equals rho cos phi and y equals rho sine phi, to convert to polar coordinates. When we do this, our region D becomes much, much simpler. We can see that in terms of rho and phi, the region consists of all points where rho is between 1 and 2, and phi is between 0 and pi over 2. It's a rectangle, right? Much, much friendlier. One small but important matter that we have to address is that this transformation from x's and y's into rows and phi's may cause some distortion in area. After all, rectangles in the polar system really come from these curved polar rectangles in the Cartesian system, and there's no reason to believe that the area of these two regions is going to be the same. So how exactly do areas change when we convert x's and y's into rows and phi's? Well, if you think back to our last lesson, we saw that our area factor, dA, in the Cartesian system got warped into rho d rho d phi in the polar system. This change aside, everything else regarding double integrals translates very nicely between Cartesian and polar coordinates. Our original double integral in Cartesian coordinates can be rewritten using the bounds on rho and phi shown here. We replace the x and y terms in our function with the transformations involving rho and phi, and we replace our old area factor, dA, with our new area factor, rho d rho d phi. Now it turns out that this whole process is really a special case of our change of variables formula. If you've understood the steps I've outlined for you here, you're now ready to move on to the general case. Moving on to the general case, our problem is exactly the same. We have some region dxy in the xy plane over which we'd like to integrate our function. But for whatever reason, there's something that's making the integration very difficult. It could be the case that our region is neither type 1 nor type 2, sort of like this region here. It could be the case that the boundary curves of our region are difficult to work with. It could also be the case that our function is really nasty. And maybe, as it's written, in terms of x and y, we just can't find a nice antiderivative. Regardless of the reason, the goal is the same. We want to make our integration easier by ditching x and y and transforming them into new variables. We'll call them u and v. Hopefully, this transformation will result in either a simpler region, a nicer function, something to make integration easier. Of course, just like when it came to polar coordinates, we have to be mindful of how such a transformation might distort our areas. That is, if we think of x as a function of two new variables, u and v, and same for y, what happens to that dA factor that appeared in our integral in the Cartesian coordinates? How does it change? To answer this question, we'll need a new definition. We'll define something called the Jacobian of our transformation, and it will be a number or an expression that will help us to understand how our area is being distorted. We denote the Jacobian by partial xy over partial uv, and it's the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix. The first column is partial x by partial u, partial y by partial u, and the second is partial x by partial v, partial y by partial v. This notation, by the way, is really just notation. This isn't a fraction, there's no weird derivative formula taking place behind the scenes, it's just a reminder of the expression that we have here on the right. 
Now here's the really cool part. The distortion in area caused by this transformation is given by the absolute value of the Jacobian, partial xy over partial uv. And then of course we have our du dv, or it could be dv du, it depends on whether this region is type 1 or type 2. Often though we'll be converting it into a rectangle, so the order doesn't matter. Now I'm sure you're all wondering, what the heck is this Jacobian? Why does it tell us the distortion of area? This turns out to be a pretty complicated question, and so I'm not going to be getting into the full details here. The textbook does a decent job of explaining it, but they do sweep some important details under the rug. Still, their explanation's not bad, so check out the textbook. The way that I like to think about this, though, is in terms of linear algebra. In linear algebra, you probably learned that the determinant of a linear map tells you how much change in area or change in volume takes place when you apply the transformation. Well, the exact same thing is taking place here. It just turns out to be true even when your map is nonlinear. Now, although we aren't going to formally prove that the Jacobian tells us the distortion of area caused by a transformation, we are going to verify this in our one known example of change of variables, the change from Cartesian to polar coordinates. In this case, our Jacobian is given by the determinant of this two by two matrix, partial x by partial rho, partial y by partial rho, partial x by partial phi, partial y by partial phi. Okay, I have to compute these four derivatives. I have the determinant of, well, partial x by partial rho is gonna be cos phi, partial y by partial rho is gonna be sine phi, partial x by partial phi will be minus rho sine phi, and partial y by partial phi will be rho cos phi. I take the determinant by multiplying the cross terms and taking their difference. In this case, our determinant is rho cos squared phi plus rho sine squared phi. Ah, and would you look at this? Cos squared phi plus sine squared phi is going to be one, so our Jacobian is really rho. Recall from the last lesson that rho was found to be the distortion factor when converting to polar coordinates. Our little area, dA, got warped into rho, d rho, d phi in the polar system. So you've just seen that this Jacobian really does tell us the area distortion factor of the polar coordinate transformation. If you're willing to believe that it works for other transformations as well, we're ready to state our change of variables formula. This result allows you to convert x, y integrals into u, v integrals. The setup is we have x as a function of u and v, y as a function of u and v, and we're going to ask that the Jacobian is non-zero in the domain of u and v. This is a weird assumption that we haven't talked about yet, but really it's nothing outrageous. This condition just guarantees that the transformation of x and y into u and v is invertible we can undo that transformation. So if this is the case, we can replace our xy integral with a uv integral doing exactly what we did for polar coordinates. We use our new region that we get from the uv plane, so we'll have new bounds. We'll replace our x's and y's with expressions involving u's and v's, and we'll change our area factor. Our new area factor is the absolute value of the Jacobian du dv. I know this formula looks a little scary, but it's really not so bad once you get a little practice. So I have one more slide with a few quick tips for you, and then we'll jump into some examples. Here are a few quick tips to keep in mind when approaching change of variables problems. First, the problem is likely asking you to evaluate some kind of an integral, and it wants you to transform your x's and y's into u's and v's. So the first step would be to pick a good transformation. The word good here could mean lots of different things. Maybe the transformation really simplifies your domain. It could be that it turns it into a rectangle. Or maybe your transformation really simplifies your function. When we start solving some examples, you'll see how such transformations can be picked. Secondly, you're going to need to know how your transformation distorts areas. So your next step would be to compute this Jacobian. Thirdly, your integral is going to need some new bounds, right? It's now in terms of u and v. So you're either going to have to sketch this new region, and I'll show you how to do this in some examples, or maybe you were strategic from the start. You picked u and v with specific bounds in mind. 
Again, you'll see this in the examples. Step four, integrate your new expression using the change of variables formula. And finally, tip number five, keep trying. Remember that these problems are challenging, and if you don't get it at first, that's okay. Keep trying, you'll get it with practice.